welcome to Timekeeping. This show will attempt to chronicle year-by-year -year changes to Disneyland Paris, from the excitement of a new ride opening to the minutia of a store changing names. Join us as we celebrate 30 years of the resort. Main Street USA at Euro Disneyland began development under Imagineer Eddie Sato as not the childhood home of Walt Disney, but rather America in the 1920s. Trolley lines would move streetcars rather than horses, automobiles would be more prevalent, and the use of electricity and jazz music would be in full swing. Budget concerns in developing a wholly new land made Michael Eisner revert plans back to the main street of Walt's Marceline, Missouri childhood. The Plaza East and Plaza West boutiques are located on each side of the Disneyland Hotel and the park entrance. The East Side Boutique features a theme based on Main Street USA, while the West Side Boutique has a Victorian rodeo theme. Main Street Station is the first structure visitors see upon entering the park. Its elevated station building is the barrier between reality and fantasy. It's traditional for a plaque to be placed above the tunnels under Main Street Station reading, here you leave today and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. However, in Paris, the plaque reads somewhat differently due to the park's differing lands, announcing, here you leave today and enter the worlds of history, discovery, and ageless fantasy. The layout of the station is inspired by the facade of It's a Small World at Disneyland, where the trains go in front of the facade and then behind the center clock. The train station has the same outline as a glass covering that spans the track, linking the main building with the adjacent structure and closing the organ. The station building isn't tall as it had to be low enough in order not to block the view of guests staying at the nearby Disneyland Hotel. Countless elements of the building are adorned with the initials EDLRR. This abbreviation stands for Euro Disneyland Railroad, the original name in the line for the park's name change. Besides countless props and notice boards, one of the station's most beloved details amongst fans are the four stunning stained glass windows sitting across the tracks facing the entrance of the park. Each represents a different land, Frontierland, Adventureland, Fantasyland, and Discoveryland. A maroon red band organ sits as the centerpiece of the station. Originally, this played a pre-recorded swelling fanfare as each train arrived. Though all of its horns and musical parts are real, the orchestrion itself is a piece of cabinetry made to look like an organ, the inspiration coming from a cabinet seen by Imagineers at the Smithsonian Institute. The staircases and the cast iron structure are inspired by New York's elevated train stations. Before the arrival of a train, an announcement of the station master can be heard. The spiel was voiced by Eddie Sato himself. Now arriving from Grand Circle trip around Disneyland Paris. Last call. The train station has three portals leading into Main Street. This is unique to Disneyland Paris. The floors are all paved with English encaustic tiles made in the tradition of the 19th century. Train number one, the George Washington, is based on a Civil War military train and painted in coordinating colors. The passenger cars are named after battle sites of the war. The coaches were designed for each train by Imagineer Thom York. The Holiday represents a leisure train that would typically take Americans on holidays an excursion train of the East Coast and New York. The WF Cody represents the trains of the Old West, based on the Denver and Rio Grande railroads. Trains first cross a diorama recreation of the Grand Canyon, complete with wild animals and storm effects, and also one that hides the show building for Phantom Manor. As they arrive in Frontierland, traveling the rivers of the Far West, they first stop in Frontierland Depot. The trains then travel through the Adventureland section, witnessing the inside of Pirates of the Caribbean. Fantasyland Station is located in the British part of Fantasyland, which also includes Peter Pan's Flight, Alice's Curious Labyrinth, and Toad Hall. Here, guests are given a whole view of the land, and then the trains venture through the facade of It's a Small World. Finally, the trains pass through Discoveryland. Eventually, there would be a station. Main Street's architecture in Paris was modeled after the Walt Disney World version. Envisioned to be covered like World Bazaar in Tokyo Disneyland originally, it was decided that the inability to have parades come down the street and the European tendency to enjoy outdoor dining was enough reason to do something different. Arcades were built at the backside of both sides of the street instead, offering a beautiful passage and museum quality exhibits. With the money saved not building a giant roof, Imagineers were able to plus the interiors of the Main Street shops and restaurants to far exceed the Florida version. The Liberty Arcade can be reached via doors at either end or by Liberty Court on Flower Street. The Emporium, Disney & Company, and Casey's Corner link directly into the walkway. 
From the eastern corner of Town Square, you step through the heavy wooden doors into the warm shelter of Liberty Arcade, a covered walkway spanning the length of the street, lit by both gas and electric, constructed with ornate ironwork displaying the statue's crowned head. Liberty Arcade represents the story of the Statue of Liberty through historic photographs, artwork, and display cases, a story which links France to the United States of America and Main Street USA to the earlier, less lawful times of Frontierland and beyond. Within Liberty Arcade and the whole of Disneyland Paris, it could be said that the gift of liberty has come full circle, for it was France who in 1886 presented liberty enlightening the world to the United States. The statue was designed by Frederick Auguste Bartholdi with its internal structure engineered by none other than Alexander Gustav Eiffel. The first section of Liberty Arcade details the incredible process with rare photographs and unique scale models of the monument under design, initial construction, and shipping to America. Both arcades are split into three distinct sections, with the first and last reasonably similar across both walkways. The middle of each arcade, however, is a break from the regularity, and in this case of the Liberty Arcade, one of the most lavish and eye-catching areas in the whole of the park. The story of the monument continues here with its completion and dedication on Liberty Island, New York. Liberty Court, an ornate white building featuring stained glass windows of the statue with the numerals 1886, leads from Flower Street into the extravagant circular area. Filled with advertisements of jubilation and an exquisite tile floor, the court celebrates the completion of the Liberty Monument and beckons guests behind the curtains of a traditional sideshow scene, the Statue of Liberty Tableau. The murals throughout Liberty Arcade were inspired by the Universal Exhibition of 1876. Imagineers visited a reconstruction of part of the exhibit in the Smithsonian Institute, spending hours perfecting the design before they were finally painted by Jim Michelson. In this atmospheric and often missed corner, you can attend the inauguration of Lady Liberty yourself, watching from a ship in the harbor of New York as steamships sound their horns and crowds cheer the completion of the Statue of Liberty. Atmospheric sounds of fireworks and lights bring the moment to life. Now dedicated with fireworks and celebrations, the final portion of Liberty Arcade celebrates the lasting legacy and impact of the Statue of Liberty, as if Lady Liberty were sending a postcard to her old friends in France. This area, bringing the story right up to date with Main Street USA, is considerably more lively and modern, with extra seating for Casey's Corner flowing along the arcade, alongside a picture of the World Trade Center in New York Harbor. At the end of Liberty Arcade, a somewhat hidden route to the left leads along the Thunder Mesa Express path to Frontierland, and a time before Lady Liberty had arrived. You can follow this through Fort Comstock and around the winding paths to Adventureland Bazaar, then go on to Pirates of the Caribbean and Peter Pan's flight all the way at the back of the park without getting wet. The Discovery Arcade can be reached via entrances at either end or by Main Street Marketplace on Market Street. Disney Clothiers, Market House Deli, Cable Car Bake Shop, Harrington's, and Victoria's Homestyle Restaurant link directly onto the walkway, which is also the home of the Coffee Grinder and the Ice Cream Company. Through the heavy wooden doors of Town Square or the open walkway from Plaza Gardens, you step into Discovery Arcade in a time of great ideas and great inventions. The boom of the turn of the century gave those of the time a feeling that anything can and will be achieved by man. Discovery Arcade pays homage to these great minds, from their ingenious yet humble patents to their wildest dreams of futuristic cities. As you stroll along the warm, gaslit arcade of wooden features and striking green ironwork, Large, startling posters depict cities 100 years into the future, whilst in contrast, display cases house inventions and ideas from the most local, small-town, turn-of-the-century visionaries. The central area of Discovery Arcade is a break from the style of the two walkways either side. Here, the optimistic warmth turns into a more industrial brickwork style, and the faintly gothic features show Main Street's youthful optimism growing up and moving on, to the dramatic worlds of Discovery Land which lie beyond. The models of inventions in the Discovery Arcade display cases are all authentic patent applications from between 1790 and 1880. To be granted a patent in America between 1790 and 1880, you were required to submit a working model of the invention to the U.S. Patent Office. Models were usually limited to no larger than 12 square inches and were accompanied with paperwork and diagrams explaining the invention's purpose, construction, and operation. More than 200,000 models were submitted during this time. However, fires at the Patent Office in 1863 and 1877 destroyed tens of thousands of these, and eventually the agency ran out of space with Congress ordering the remaining patent models to be sold in 1925. 
American millionaire Cliff Peterson bought close to 40,000 of the models and much of their paperwork, his collection then being sold to enthusiastic Alan Rothschild in the early 1990s when it numbered 4,000 pieces. Today, examples from Rothschild's collection can be seen only in two places, the trademark office in Alexandria, Virginia, and in Discovery Arcade at Disneyland Paris, where 52 authentic proposals are on display. The metalwork supports lining the arcade are decorated with silhouettes of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, the famous drawing depicting the ideal proportions of man. The much celebrated posters depicting cities of the future at the turn of the next century, which line the walls of Discovery Arcade, in fact date back to no earlier than the late 1980s. They were all designed, drawn, and painted exclusively for the park by Jim Michelson, Maureen Johnson, and R. Viscous in the style of 19th century French artist Albert Robida. Like many of the inventions and patents on display in Discovery Arcade itself, some of the ideas for the arcade never became reality either. The most mythical is without a doubt the elevated electric railway. This unique means of transportation would have spanned the length of the arcade at an elevated level, running from a station where the Main Street Transportation Building now sits, to near Plaza Gardens Restaurant, and possibly at times even into Discovery Land as part of the 1920s era Main Street project. The idea would be resurrected for Tokyo Disney Sea, where it connects 1910's New York to Port Discovery, which in many ways mirrors Discovery Land in Paris. The gazebo in Town Square was something Walt wanted, but couldn't have due to the layout of Disneyland. The original gazebo was removed and sold, but rebuilt for Disneyland Paris. Its purpose here was to block the view of the castle from the atypical central entrance portal of the train station. That way you couldn't see the castle just yet. The horse-drawn streetcars take guests on a relaxing trip down Main Street with stops on Town Square and Central Plaza. For their debut on opening day of Paris, the streetcars of the horse-drawn streetcars were entirely redesigned, placing guests facing inwards in a covered cabin rather than open to the elements. The streetcars are considerably more elaborate inside and out than their international cousins. Their wood-paneled interiors featuring advertisements for such well-known Main Street businesses as the Market House Deli, Harmony Barbershop, Ribbons and Bows Hat Shop, and the Main Street Gazette. They're numbered simply 101, 102, and 103, all featuring the wording Main, Flower, and Market Streets along their sides, relating to the two secondary side streets at the heart of Main Street. The design of the trolley cars was inspired by the ones that could be seen in the movie Hello Dolly in 1969. Unique to Paris is the Main Street Transportation Company building. Situated on the east side of Town Square, this turn-of-the-century red brick terminus houses the street cars when they're not in operation. The Imagineers cleverly designed it to have the same silhouette of the original Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland Park. The Main Street vehicles consist of six conveyances. The fire truck, which has 12 passengers, the omnibus at 35, the limousine, which can carry eight, the Mercer, which carries just two, the paddy wagon, which carries eight, and the one no guest can actually ride upon, the Main Street deliveries truck. The truck is unique to Disneyland Paris and was designed by the Paris branch of Walt Disney Imagineering and then built by Severn Lamb in the United Kingdom, who also built Eureka, the Disneyland Railroad's fourth engine, as well as the engines of the Hong Kong Disneyland Railroad. City Hall is located on your left as soon as you enter Town Square. It was inspired by the tower of the Western Union Telegraph Building in New York City. Inside guests will find commendation that had been given to Walt by the French government during his military service. There's also a photo of Walt Disney as an ambulance driver in 1918 during the First World War in the first aid location. The Arboretum is situated on the left-hand side of City Hall. An Arboretum is a place where many varieties of trees are grown for research, educational, and ornamental purposes. It often appeared in Victorian imagery. The venue is characterized, as you might guess, by its arbors. These walkways needed to be built to protect guests from the rain, from the ticket complex, all the way to Central Plaza. Located in Town Square, the Storybook Store is designed to resemble a small town children's library. The interior of the store was loosely inspired by the library that could be seen in the movie musical The Music Man, based on the hit Broadway play and released in 1962. It also takes inspiration from the cast iron architecture of New York City. All the props that could be found in the library of the Storybook Store were imported from the United States. The animated Tigger figure located at the entrance of the shop would automatically hand stamp books like a librarian would do. This made the books extra special for a little child. The Ribbons and Bows hat shop had an all wood grain interior, and upon the park's opening it sold primarily headwear and of course offered embroidery services like at most Disney parks. 
Inspired by the grand department stores of the time, the Emporium features columns inside inspired by the Del Coronado Hotel in San Diego, California. One ceiling decoration is especially lovely, a stained glass tribute to the famous inventors who immigrated to America, including Nikola Tesla, Alexander Graham Bell, and Henry Ford. Walt Disney was a big admirer of inventors, so this is a fitting tribute. The interior also has an homage to an antiquated money exchange system. In old retailing, the cashier would put money in a basket, snap the lid shut, and put the sales check in with it, but they weren't allowed to handle the change. They would pull a cord to send the basket upstairs where they would make the change and do the sales check and then send it back out to the cashier. The facade of Dapper Dan's haircuts is an exact copy of the exterior of the 1971 Harmony Barber Shop that used to be located on West Center Street at the Magic Kingdom. The windows are adorned with gold leaf signage. On the right side of the facade of Dapper Dan's haircuts, one could see a mirror painting. Applying a mirrored surface to a window was something that was occasionally done to create a very striking graphic. The mirror painting features the facility's original name as it opened in 1992, the Harmony Barber Shop. Eddie Sato and his team looked at photographs of barber shops and parlors at the turn of the 20th century to design the interior. The floor of the barber shop has a black and white checkered pattern. It was typical of the 1920s. Close to the entrance, there is a nickel-plated copper device on a cast iron enameled base. That's an antique towel steamer. In a barber shop, a hot towel is applied to the face of the client to soften the beard so that a close, comfortable shave can be given. Furthermore, these steamers were used as a source of hot water to create soap lather. The walls were covered in maroon-colored wallpaper to give the space a masculine feel. The motifs are based on real Victorian designs. The wall covering was silk screened by hand by a company called Bradbury and Bradbury Art Wallpapers. The barber shop is also equipped with an old-fashioned telephone, allowing guests to listen in on the conversations of the residents of Main Street. Eddie and his colleague Craig Fleming and Gabrielle Reynolds were primarily the voices used for the phone calls. Eddie created the basic concepts for the conversations and Craig Fleming was responsible for the written scripts. The cabinetry is typical of barber shops at the turn of the 20th century. They hold many shaving mugs and mustache mugs. In many a barber shop of the time, a fitted shelf held spots for the mugs of its patrons. The status of a barbershop was boosted by the number of mugs on display and the type of occupations or organizations that were depicted. Having a personalized shaving mug for everyone to see also encouraged customers to return to the barbershop regularly. One of the cabinets also features what is called a spittoon. It's a pot with a funnel-shaped top that was used for spitting used chewing tobacco into. The shop was originally accompanied by its own barbershop quartet known as the Main Street Quartet, or one of the most important opening day streetmosphere acts performing songs around the Main Street from 1992 until 1995. Waltz, an American restaurant, is an upscale Victorian-style table service restaurant located on 1401 Flower Street. It serves classic American dishes with a French international twist. Of course, 1401 Flower Street is also the address of Walt Disney Imagineering in Glendale, California. Back in 1992, the restaurant featured two seating areas, one on the ground floor and one on the upper floor. The ground floor was divided into three dining rooms and entirely dedicated to Walt Disney and Main Street USA. The elegant dining room with a fireplace along Main Street was adorned with photos of Walt and his wife Lillian in Europe to show their love of the old continent. The second room of the bottom floor was dedicated to Main Street featuring concept art of Town Square, concept art by Herbie Ryman, and a scale model of the Bixby Babies Main Street Transportation Buildings. The third room paid tribute to Walt Disney's personal connection to Main Street. There are photos of his hometown of Marceline and the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad, a live steam backyard railroad built in the garden of his home in Holmby Hills, Los Angeles. The Imagineers wanted the guests to understand where Walt came from and where Main Street came from. The upstairs celebrates the creativity of Imagineers and how they created the lands of the park. Why can't everybody go to Club 33? As a little yeah. kid, I didn't know anybody at Disney. I wished I could have went. I had the brochure they mailed me and I, I dreamed of going to that place mm. and it was very grown up. It wasn't cutesy and I thought, well, you know, let's do a grown up environment. Um, and the operations came in and goes, you know, you you can't, you can't do these themed rooms. That's not Victorian. I go, what do you mean it's not Victorian? You can't have an Arab room. You can't have an Arabic room. That looks like the Arabian Nights in there. That's Adventureland, Eddie. You're, that's not Main Street. I go, here. Here's research books that show New York mansions yeah. where people that didn't travel would decorate in Victorian style. Mm -hmm. 
rooms to look like different cultures. That was very popular. These par parlors that were Chinese, that's where the decorative arts came from, or for, you know, all these various things. And then they went, oh, okay, you can do it. So we said, no, when Walt Disney's dream gets built, the upstairs is all about the making of dreams. In contrast to the other Main Street venues, the Disney & Co. shop does not try to replicate a historic interior, but rather uses bygone themes and elements to create an environment that supports the sale of the merchandise offered. After all, plush and toys were traditionally the prizes you could have won at a fair. The design and style of the shop was inspired by the images from the book Fairground Art by Joff Whedon and Richard Ward, and the Disney movie So Dear to My Heart and Summer Magic. As guests enter the front door of the Disney & Company store, stunningly decorated with American stained glass, they'll immediately notice a huge hot air balloon holding three Disney characters. The interior of Disney & Co. is reminiscent of the Greek Revival. This architectural style was typical of the time and works well with the Americana theme. Decorations inspired by the flag of the United States of America, such as festooning and bunting, were used throughout. This perfectly fits the American patriotism that was so prevalent in the turn of the century small town celebrations. Historical light fixtures and colorful billboards line the walls. All the billboards refer to the products on sale or exhibits featuring curiosities that can be found at many traveling carnivals. Carousels made by the Philadelphia Toboggan Company inspired the design of the circular area in the center of the store. The Philadelphia Toboggan Company, or PTC, is the oldest existing roller coaster manufacturing company in the world. Based in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, it was established in 1904 by Henry B. Auchi and Chester Albright, making various amusement devices, including carousels until 1934, wooden roller coasters, and their trains. The company's carousels were known for their elaborate carvings and elegant decorations. The PTC carousel horses are part of the Philadelphia style of carousel horse. Philadelphia style horses are carved to be more realistic than the fanciful Coney Island style carousel horses, but more elaborate than the simpler country fair ones. PTC carousel horses were known for their sweet features and detailed armor. Most of the PTC carousels have been numbered so they could easily be identified. FE number 46 was built in 1917 for the Detroit Palace Garden Park. Nowadays, it's known by the name Prince Charming Regal Carousel and is located in Fantasyland at the Magic Kingdom. Beautiful rounding boards can be found above the shopping shelves of the Disney & Co. store. Rounding boards are the scenery panels that surround the top of a carousel. Often adorned with carvings, mirrors, paintings, and lights, these panels are curved to give the carousel its round appearance. They serve a dual purpose of hiding machinery as well as giving the carousel a sparkling appearance to attract customers. Imagineers use both the Philadelphia and Coney Island style to inform the rounding boards and styling of the store. The panels featuring reproductions of iconic prints published by the legendary printmaking firm Courier and Ives. The circular area in the center of the store features an impressive band organ that played songs in the early days of the park. It represented the music that drove the carousel. This band organ would eventually find its home at the entrance of Pete's Silly Sideshow in the Magic Kingdom. Located at the left-hand side of Main Street right on the hub, Casey's Corner offers guests a wide range of delicious, meant-to-be-fast dishes in sport-themed surroundings. For Imagineering, baseball, America's favorite pastime at the end of the 19th century, seemed the perfect match for a restaurant where hot dogs, soda, and french fries were served. After all, this type of food is traditionally sold at baseball games. The graphic design, costumes, and imagery of baseball was so beautiful that Sato and his team thought anyone would enjoy it. The imagery of Casey is derived from the Disney short cartoon called Casey at the Bat, released August 15, 1946. This timeless original poem was first published in the San Francisco Examiner on June 3, 1888. It tells the tale of the mighty popular Casey of the Mudville Nine, who steps up to bat and strikes out during the crucial moment of a baseball game. The text is filled with references to baseball as it existed in 1888. The exterior of the Casey's Corner building is marked with a large letter C similar to the logo of the Cincinnati Reds Baseball Club. A carved figure of Casey can be found near the front door, reminiscent of what used to be called a cigar store Indian. When entering the building, you may notice the Casey's Corner poster drawn by Jim Michelson. This Imagineering artist was responsible for many of the other Disneyland Paris Main Street posters and a lot of the art we've already mentioned in this episode. The Casey's poster is based on a cover illustration of one of the Spalding baseball guides. The dining hall of Casey's Corner is lavishly decorated with loads of vintage baseball and Coca-Cola memorabilia. 
A lot of the Coca-Cola artifacts were exclusively reproduced for the Euro Disneyland project after historic images were found in the archives of the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. One of them are the Coke light fixtures, manufactured in the tradition of Louis Tiffany, which were once provided to American drugstores for promotional use. In the same room, a xylophone of Coca-Cola bottles can be admired. Sato once told he dreamt of a kind of scoreboard above Casey's counter, which would show visitors how much Coca-Cola had been sold throughout the day, as traditionally these locations sell more Coca-Cola than anywhere in the world. Due to technical issues, the idea was abandoned. Americans can experience the magic of Casey's Corner too, as Walt Disney World adopted Casey's Corner's theme in the mid-1990s. Town Square photography is meant to be a photo essay of Americana, but Imagineers didn't want to shoot it. They instead went searching for real vintage photographs to place around the store. The highly themed photographer's office was designed and supervised by Eddie as well, who spent long hours recreating the feel of a real office. He famously sat in the chair and for hours placed items where he felt the actual photographer would have. Since saltwater taffy is one of the few truly American candies, the Boardwalk Candy Palace would be based on the amusement piers of Atlantic City, New Jersey. As with most establishments, out of fear that Europeans wouldn't be able to read most of the signage in certain languages, a lavish mural was painted in the store to explain to guests what the theme was. Meanwhile, illuminated columns of glass candy bring bursts of color into the space. Back in 1992, Main Street Motors, presented by Esso, paid tribute to the early days of American automobile industries and the development of the assembly line technique for the mass production of cars. The shop featured an exquisite collection of vintage vehicles that were actually up for sale. There was one motorcycle, an Auto Cycle Model G, by the Excelsior Auto Cycle Motor Manufacturing and Supply Company made in 1911. Then there were three motor cars. The High Wheeler Model C by the reliable Dayton Motor Car Company in 1907, the 30 Gentlemen's Roadster by the Everett Metzger Flanders Company in 1908, and a 1911 Oakland Model 33 Touring by the Oakland Motor Car Company, also made in 1911. The average price tag of the cars was 100,000 US dollars back in July of 1993. If a guest did buy one of these expensive antique vehicles, they were allowed to drive them through the garage doors and even in the day's parade. It never happened. The showroom was richly decorated with tires, tools, car parts, old photos, and advertisement posters. Main Street Motors carried a vast selection of die-cast toy cars, souvenir license plates, posters, and postcards, too. The Market House Deli has the look of a country market and a general store. Walt Disney Imagineering decided to install an antique telephone switchboard behind the counter to give guests the idea that the telephone service was located at the deli. The ceiling of the market house is made of fine pressed tin panels. A tin ceiling is an architectural element that was very popular in Victorian buildings in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The restaurant is nicely decorated with posters and food cans. Most of the cans are real antiques, although Walt Disney Imagineering copied the label so it looked like the deli had many items to sell. A traditional potbelly stove weighing over 203 kilograms came out of a residential basement in Baltimore, Maryland, and as well a beautiful icebox. Named after the small town in Disney's film Summer Magic, the China store Harrington's is meant to be elegant and raise the profile of the items sold in the shop. The small facade deceives guests. As they travel further in, they'll find an ornate glass dome above the center of the store. In the late 80s, San Francisco was surveyed as the most popular place for Europeans to visit in the United States. Eddie Sato felt that dedicating part of Main Street to San Francisco would have great appeal. This beautiful city seemed to be the perfect inspiration for the cable car bake shop and Market Street. One of the things San Francisco is famous for is its painted ladies style of decoration. Painted ladies is a term used for Victorian and Edwardian houses and buildings painted in three or more colors that embellish or enhance the architectural details. This style of decoration was used by Mr. Sato and his creative team while developing the color scheme for the exterior of the Cable Car Bake Shop and the Market Street buildings. Market Street is not just home to the deli, but also two small service windows that can accommodate guests both either out on the street or inside in the Discovery Arcade, the Coffee Grinder, and the Ice Cream Company. The interior of the Cable Car Bake Shop is characterized by its pinstripe moldings, reproduction Tiffany lamps, intricate wall coverings, and brass fly fans. 
The upside down fly fans that line the dining area are based on historic research from a real cafe that once existed on 42nd Street in New York. The Imagineers tried not to make the cable car bake shop too luxurious, but rather simplistic and fun. A small stove was integrated into the facility to make it appear warm and inviting to guests. Here guests learn about the unique mode of transportation known as the cable car. The San Francisco cable car system is the world's last permanently operational, manually operated cable car system. One of the prop buyers, Imagineer Connie Holtz, made it a mission to find and collect the artifacts found in the bake shop. She lived in San Francisco and kept her eye out for special San Francisco and cable car memorabilia. There are blueprints of cars, images of their conductors, maps of San Francisco, sections of original cable car rail in which to hang your coat, and even a bell from a cable car to ring so that every guest can feel they've been a conductor. No history of San Francisco would be complete without mentioning the great earthquake of 1906. That's why they installed a kaleoscope machine to show guests what really happened. The earthquake of 1906 was a major earthquake that struck San Francisco and the coast of Northern California at 5.12 a.m. on Wednesday, April 18th. It had an estimated magnitude of 7.8. The earthquake and resulting fire are remembered as one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the U.S. The death toll was estimated to be above 3,000. The economic impact of that event has been compared with the more recent Hurricane Katrina. The cookie kitchen operates at a counter at the front of the restaurant, but also serves guests at a window just outside. The Gibson Girl Ice Cream Parlor was designed to be the place in a small town where teenage boys and young girls would meet for a soda. The color scheme for its interior was painted black and cream using marble and rich woods. The checkerboard floor pattern is typical for turn-of-the-century soda fountains. The chairs of the Gibson Girl are uniquely American. They're known as sweetheart chairs and made on a very special wire bending machine that twists each back of each chair. It features a wrought iron openwork back with a heart-shaped design and round padded seat. They're classically seen in old-fashioned ice cream parlors and soda shops. The back bar of the ice cream parlor was inspired by an image in a historic Coca-Cola catalog. The fly fans on the ceiling are driven by belts. They are vintage and were shipped from the United States of America as antiques. The music at the Gibson Girl differs from the rest of Main Street. It's inspired by the work of Fritz Schultz Reichel, a German jazz and pop pianist who called himself Crazy Otto. He invented a device called the Tipsy Wire Box, which could be attached to the piano to make it sound like an out-of-tune barrel house upright. The Gibson Girl Ice Cream Parlor is a tribute to Charles Dana Gibson, an American graphic artist noted for his creation of the Gibson Girl, an iconic representation of the beautiful and independent American woman at the turn of the 20th century. Victoria's Homestyle Restaurant was intended to be like a visit to your grandmother's boarding house. It was divided into five rooms. The one with the organ in it is the living room. Then we have the glass conservatory with the bird cages, the hall, the kitchen, which has the service counter, and the intimate dining room. The bedrooms are supposed to be located on the upper floor, and if you stand long enough outside of Victoria's, you'll hear one of the renters upstairs taking a shower and perhaps turning up the heat a little too high. This interrupts his annoying shower singing with some yelps of pain. The romantic Victorian sense of color and proportion was inspired by Disney films Summer Magic, Pollyanna, The Happiest Millionaire, and Lady and the Tramp. Walt Disney Imagineers exposed the power cables on the walls as it was done back in Victorian times in this way to simulate the electric light had just been introduced to the home. The piece of furniture behind the counter was designed to hide the modern kitchen equipment and make you feel like you're in a kitchen of a century ago. Its cabinets with perforated holes are called pie safes. The pie safe was used for centuries to store cakes, pies, and other sweets away from flies and other pests. The facade of Victoria's Homestyle Restaurant was reused for Main Street USA at Walt Disney World in Orlando. You may recognize it as part of the Plaza Restaurant. Speaking of the Plaza Restaurant, the Plaza Gardens Restaurant can be found here in Paris. In backstory, it was built on the edge of a small town in 1861 and surrounded by a small park. Over the next 10 years, the railroad was extended into the city and with it, the population grew. The increasing wealth of the small town is shown, especially at Plaza Gardens, which is decorated with lots of marble and golden wallpaper. You can see this development in the large murals painted by David Negron in the Plaza Gardens restaurant. You'll also get an idea of what various events would happen at the gardens throughout the seasons. Perhaps the most elegant and beautiful Main Street ever constructed could only lead to perhaps the most elegant and beautiful castle ever built for a Disney park. Well, time sure flies. If you're enjoying this jump from time to time with us, 
please hit the like button and please subscribe for more great content. If you'd like to support this show and others, you can join the WDWNT Inner Globe Society at patreon.com slash WDWNT. To pick up the perfect gear for your next visit to a Disney park, head on over to Carousel of Products at carouselofproducts.com. If you're enjoying hearing about Main Street USA at Disneyland Paris, why not hear about it from someone that actually helped create the land? Imagine you're Eddie Sada. We have a full-length interview available right here on our YouTube channel. We'll see you real soon right here on Timekeeping.